This morning, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 today. And I just thinking about what a great day this is, I was reminded of this story that I read years ago. And uh, the story went like this, I'll paraphrase it, but I don't know if we, I know we have some uh, motorcyclists that are, that are here today, because I see you guys parked out in the, in the parking lot, but uh, there was a story of this man that was working on his motorcycle in his backyard, and uh, he was cleaning it up, and uh, something happened. I forget exactly what the story said. Either he, he kicked the clutch while his, his sleeve got stuck on the throttle or something happened where he ended up throttling himself straight through the back sliding glass window of his house. And so he went, shattered. And you know how thick those sliding glass doors are. You know, he crashed right through them, crashed into his kitchen table and was sprawled out on the floor. And his wife, hearing this huge crash, came running into the kitchen and saw the bike tipped over and gasoline spilt all over the kitchen floor, saw her husband laying there just lacerated from this accident, and she immediately calls 911. And so, you know, the 911 uh, response team comes and they, they, they get him uh, uh, into, the, into the hospital, you know, get him, you know, picked up, cleaned up a little bit, and uh, off, to the, off to where the, the emergency vehicle was outside. And so uh, she starts blotting up the gasoline. You know, she grabs a couple uh, paper towels, you know, a whole roll of paper towels, starts blotting up the gasoline that was on the kitchen floor and and throws that in the the downstairs bathroom toilet there. And then, you know, she lifts up his bike and, you know, just sets it against what was the, you know, the window there. And uh, the story goes on to say is that uh, the husband comes home, and I forget if it was his his, uh, neighbor or whoever took him, or uncle or brother or whatever took him to the hospital. He comes back and he sees what happened to his room, his kitchen just completely blown out. He sees his bike that he loved, his precious baby, absolutely mangled there against the wall. And it said that he became despondent, uh, the exact words, and he went into the, into the downstairs bathroom and lit a cigarette as he was sitting down there on, on, the, on the thing that you sit down on. And it says that he flicked his cigarette between his legs, not knowing that the toilet was filled with the rags that were blotting up gasoline. And the story went on to say that the wife heard a huge explosion and screaming, and there were things on fire that weren't meant to be on fire, you know, and that kind of thing. And she comes running in, and she's like, what happened? And, and she's like, oh, no, he can't even talk. And, and she's like, I told you to stop smoking, or whatever she said, you know. And, and uh, it says that the paramedics were still in the neighborhood, and they came swung back around. And as they loaded him up on the gurney because he couldn't walk, it says as they were coming down the front stairs that they tipped him over and dropped him out. And it says that he broke his arm. And it says that they did that because the wife told them the story of what happened with this guy and they were laughing so hard that they dropped him out. And it said the title of this article that I read said, You Think You're Having a Bad Day. And when I think of these kind of things that happen, when we have bad days and we're reminded, man, I could have it so much more worse off. I could have these things that are happening in my life, but there's always somebody else that's way worse off. In Romans 6, verses 21 through 23, Paul writes and he says, What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, talking about sin and the things that you do that are wrong. They lead to shame, and the Bible says they lead to death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so this morning we have point number one of three that we'll be looking at today. Point number one, the law of Moses, this is what we're looking at, the the religious law, the law brings dominion because of sin. Now, Paul is going to be speaking to those who know the law, and I find it very interesting that it just so happens that the study that we'd be having this morning on the law would be the very day that our own police chief would be our guest. And it says in verse 1, it says, of Romans 7, Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law? That the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. As long as you're alive, the law has the power or the right or the governing, the right of governing and controlling. Now, 
I know this might be a day for the record books as far as stories go, but I came across this article. It was actually from South Korea. And you think, well, how in the world are you reading an article from South Korea? Well, you'll know why after I uh, share this with you this morning. It says, a man dies after 50 hours of computer games. And it says, a South Korean left a seat in internet cafe only to use the toilet and to take brief naps. And it says, a South Korean man who played computer games for 50 hours almost nonstop died of heart failure minutes after finishing his mammoth session in an internet cafe, authorities said on Tuesday. Now, for all of you kids that have had parents telling you, stop playing video games so much, this is why. Right here. Some of you are here, and some of your mom and dads are like, preach it, preacher, please. It says this 28-year-old man, identified only by his family name Lee, had been playing online battle simulation games at the Cyber Cafe. No doubt, Call of Duty or something. Who knows? It says that they presume the cause of death was heart failure stemming from exhaustion. It said Lee had recently quit his job to spend more time playing games. And it says that reported that after they interviewed former work colleagues, that they said that he quit his job to play more video games. And after he failed to return home, Lee's mother asked his former colleagues to find him. And when they reached the cafe, Lee said he would just finish that one game and then go home. And it said that he died a few minutes later. You think, man, how awful is that? But let me tell you something right now. The police didn't come up to him and give him a ticket for loitering in the internet cafe. Why? Because he was free from the law. The man didn't get a ticket because then once he was gone, they couldn't, the, the, the law had no power or governance over him. And so Paul uses this example of the legalities of a marriage relationship now in verse 2 as we look at it. So think about this. He's painting this picture. He's saying this is what the law says. And if you have died and passed away, you are not going to be under the law any longer. But look what verse 2 says. For the woman who has a husband, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Now, you, uh, you hear these stories all the time of, you know, this guy that's living in one part of the country and he's married to this woman, supposedly, and they have kids. And then over in Hawaii, he has another family or whatnot. You know, married to this person uh, over here while he's married to someone over there, as you guys know, it's illegal. You know, this isn't sister wives on TV or anything, anything like this. If a person is legally married to one person and then gets together with another different person that is considered adultery by the sight of God, it's also illegal. We're not to be married to two separate people. However, if you're not legally married or if your spouse passes away, it's not illegal or against God to be married. So he's using this analogy of marriage. So the law has power over me as long as I am alive and connected to it. I think this is something that we would all understand. And Paul is laying the groundwork now for the point of his metaphors found in verse 4. Okay, so he is writing to people that understand the law. If you understand the law, then you understand that as long as you're alive, you're connected to it. And once you are not connected to it, it is no longer ruling over you. And so what he's going to be sharing now is the difference between people trying to keep the law of good deeds in order to get to heaven. He's going to distinguish that from being joined and united to Christ through faith. Okay? So many people in the world today will seek to be a good enough person to get to heaven. And they'll try to do good deeds and whatever it may be. But he's going to show now that you have been free from this law of trying to earn your way to heaven because you have faith in Jesus. And so he says in verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, in that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. In Romans 6, verse 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Remember, we've been united with Jesus and identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. The old man, the old lady that we were before coming to Jesus has been put out of business through our faith. We are new creations, and the old things have passed away, and all has been made new. 
And so this law of trying to do good things to be good enough, he's trying to say, as you remember back in our studies of how many times people will say, well, you know, is my righteousness good enough for God's righteousness? And that's like saying, hey, I scored 30 points in this basketball game. How many touchdowns is that equal to? You remember that. They're non-transferable. And so my relationship with trying to earn my way to heaven has ended, which brings so much freedom. Because if you ask anybody today, you ask them, how do you get to heaven? And they'll say, be a good person. Be moral. Do good things. Be better than this other guy. But then we have to think logically, like, have you ever wondered, like, where's the line of demarcation that separates a bad person from a good person? Like, how do you start to sway over to being good and then sway over to being bad? Then everything becomes relative, and we know that if it's all about relativity, then there's no absolute truth, and then what God's Word says isn't truth. However, we know that to not be the case, that God's Word is truth and gives us very clear guidelines on what it means to be righteous in the sight of God. But the type of pressure that we have on ourselves as we're trying to be good enough to get to heaven is immense. I mean, the type of guilt that comes when, oh, I blew it, and now I'm not good enough, and what if I die now, and then I'm not good enough to get into heaven? And every world religion will say, you will not know if you're good enough to get to heaven until after you die, except for Christianity, where you know personally through faith in Jesus that it is his righteousness given to you, not you trying to earn your way. And so Paul's writing to a group of people that could even be classified as, I am a good person. You know, I'm a good person. I I try to do the good things in order to to get to heaven. He's saying, you guys understand that the law of good deeds are over you as long as you live. But if you, saying the old man, the the worst part of who you are has been crucified with Christ. It's, It's old. It's passed away. I now have faith in Jesus. I'm identifying with Jesus. Then now I'm separated from that and I'm made righteous in the sight of God through faith. Because if I'm truly a Christian, then I'll be living up to the name that literally means Christ-like. Because some people will say, aha, you say we don't do the good deeds, I'm dead to the law, so I don't do it. No, listen, if you're a Christian, you should be living Christ-like, which means doing the things that are right, obeying the laws of the land, doing things that are good. That should be coming out of your life because of your faith in your life. So this isn't saying, well, hey, just put it on my tab. I have faith in Jesus and I can sin whichever way I like. No, because that's not true saving faith. Saving faith and putting your faith in Jesus means I repent and turn from my sin and now I'm following the Lord, desiring to be pure and holy and righteous. It's no longer me trying to make sure that my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds because even if I had all the good deeds in the world, that doesn't erase my sin. And that's why Jesus came and died to remove that sin. This doesn't mean when he says you've been separated from the law that you aren't to do the things that are right, not to be model citizens in our city. What it does mean is that the law isn't my basis for my access into heaven or righteous standing before God. Does that make sense? No longer is trying to keep uh, no longer is trying to keep all the good, you know, all the rules and do all the good things, my basis for getting into heaven. That's not it anymore. The basis for me getting into heaven is through Jesus Christ who said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Remember, doing good deeds doesn't make you righteous before God. God's righteousness and man's righteousness are two completely different things. And the only righteousness that is transferable is God to us, not us to God. But now that I'm joined to Jesus and the Holy Spirit's changed my life and I am now bound by a greater law, The law of love for my Savior. And this propels me. This changes my life because otherwise it's behavior modification where I try to clean up the outside to be and hope, 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 hopefully that will make its way inside. But see, when you put your faith in Jesus, it changes who you are on the inside, and then the way you live is just exemplary of that. I've been changed by Jesus. I have faith in him. In Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, this is the Holy Spirit that dwells inside, the believer, the one that has faith in Jesus. It says, The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, most people today are trying to be joyful, peaceful, long-suffering, kind, and good 
they're trying to be faithful and gentle. They're, tr- gentle. they're trying to be a, a person that exercises self-control. But in order to be righteous before God, and it can be very, very, very hard trying to be good enough all the time. All the time. It's exhausting. It's frustrating. Yet when you have faith in Jesus, all those aforementioned fruits of the Spirit are a natural byproduct of your faith. They come out of your life because of what Jesus has done in you. And so instead of trying to clean the outside, hoping it makes its way inside, the Lord changes who we are on the inside, and it makes its way to the out. In verse 5, it says, For when we were in the flesh... The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our own members to bear fruit to death. In the flesh, which is, you know, it's the worst part of who we are. Sinful passions came to light and were compounded upon our God-given conscience by God-given law. So not only would our conscience condemn us for doing something that's wrong, now we had God's law that literally was set in stone exposing our sins showing you, hey, this is wrong. What might have been something that was your conscience telling you that that was wrong, and maybe you overrode that, that now the Lord says, no, this is wrong. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it says, now the works of the flesh, think of this as the worst part of who we are, they're evident, which are adultery and fornication and uncleanness and lewdness and idolatry and sorcery and hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you read that list and you think, oh, that's, that's the evening news every night. And over here and over there and over there, and then this thing happened over here. I mean, this is the worst part of society, the worst part of who we are. This is what we're capable of doing, even the best of us, because of our sinful nature that we have. But what does it say in verse 6 of Romans 7? It says, but now we have been delivered from the law. The, The list of trying to be good enough to get into heaven, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Though I was condemned by the law because we've all sinned and have all fallen short of God's perfect standards, I've been set free from earning my way to heaven. And now the life that I live is in this personal relationship with God, and I'm able to serve in the newness of a new life. Now, that brings us to point number two. Point number one this morning, as you recollect, was the law brings dominion, this list of trying to earn your way into heaven. Because of sin, the law rules over you, and you have to keep the law in order to be righteous, and if you can't keep it perfectly, then you're not entering into the kingdom of heaven. That's why Jesus came, and through faith in him, we're made alive. This leads us to point number two, which is the law brings knowledge because of sin. The law brings the knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. What shall we say then, verse 7, is the law sin? So, you know, people that are there and they're thinking, "Uh uh-huh. All the rules and regulations, those things are wrong. We don't need those. Get away. You know, you know, anarchists are like, well, I didn't know that was in the Bible. No, don't be ridiculous. God has given us his law. He's given us those things that are to be done and not to be done. And he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And he says, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. The law isn't sinful. It actually shows you what the mark of perfection is. It shows you this is the standard. This is the law. And at the same time, it unfortunately shows us our lack of perfection. Ah, you missed the mark. You were supposed to hit this standard, this is perfect, and you failed. And it's at that point that the law points us to our need for a Savior, a need for forgiveness. Why do I want those things that other people have? He says right here, I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. Now, my son, I like talking about him a lot. Love that little guy. He's seven, but he watches this thing on YouTube called EvanTube. Now, I don't know if you've heard of EvanTube, um, but he has like 500 million followers on YouTube, and he's like 10. 
And basically, the kid lives the dream life because he gets free shipments of every single toy known to man so that he can do a review. And so, you know, Target will send them stuff, you know, Amazon will send them stuff, Lego will send them stuff, Nintendo, PlayStation, anything you could ever see in any toy store, they send him stuff for free because he's a walking advertisement. I mean, he has like 5 million views on, you know, this new Lego minifigure or whatever. And so my son, he likes watching these things. And we've had to really, really cut down on that show because it adversely affects my son. He just starts wanting all of these different things that he never knew existed. No, Hudson, we're not watching Evan Tube anymore. Why? You know, he's at that age where he's like, well, what's the reason? And sometimes he's like, there is no reason? No, that's what I say. Other times we have explanations such as, well, because it makes you want all of these things all the time. I mean, can you imagine being my son whose birthday's in June? And so from January to June, it's like, when's it my birthday? And then from June to December, when is it Christmas? Like, how does that happen? I remember doing that when I was a kid, and I guess what goes around comes around. But finally, I said, Hudson, you can't watch this anymore. We're cutting back on this. Why? Because it makes you want all these things. And this is what he says. He's like, it doesn't, it doesn't make me want them. It just makes me interested in, extremely interested in having them. <laughs> and uh, I was like, who is this kid? I'm telling you. But we do the same thing on Pinterest or Amazon.com or the Nordstrom app or Nike or whatever. You know, we do that as adults. Hey, I don't, I, I, I don't want those things. I'm just highly interested in, in getting them one day. I want these things that I don't have, but somebody else has. The wanting the things that I don't have is called coveting. And the law of God showed me that coveting is a sin. The law came to show us that our, our spiritual condition was bankrupt. That's why we had, Moses had the Ten Commandments, which was referred to as the law. The law of Moses, the rules and regulations. See, the law helped me realize, actually, that I can't keep, I cannot keep the standards of the law perfectly. It shows me that I do fall short, that you cannot be perfect 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It shows me that the only viable option is for me to receive God's grace. See, this coveting, this sinful desire permeates our lives. See, Jesus told us in the, in the scriptures, we see that the law was spiritual. Because you have the letter of the law and then you have the spirit behind the law. Like, why was this even instituted? See, some would say, hey man, I'm innocent. I've never committed murder. But Jesus actually said, if you've hated somebody enough that you could, com- that you could kill them, then you've committed murder in your heart. Some people would say, hey, I'm righteous before God. I've never cheated on my wife. But they lust after women all the time in their hearts and think of what they want to do interactively. And Jesus said, well, you may not have actually committed the act, but you've committed adultery in your heart. I've never had sex outside of marriage, but I've had it in my heart. So you see that there are these desires that we have. Sinful desires that we have, and the law of God points out that they're sinful. It shows you that's wrong. So not only do you have your God-given conscience, but you have the God-given commandments where it's like, hey, this is set in stone, that's wrong. And then you think, well, how could anybody ever keep the law perfectly? Speed limit was 40. You grow, he drove 41 miles an hour. The letter of the law, that's, you're breaking the law. Think about that. Isn't that crazy when you think about those kind of things? Oh, you know what? I I took a pencil accidentally from from the desk counter. Was it yours? No. So you stole a pencil off the desk counter. Oh, I mean, it's just a pencil. No, I mean, if you think about the letter of the law. See, the Lord, God has given us the spirit behind why those things are there. In verse 8 it says, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. What is he saying here? Well, let me ask you this question. Have you ever noticed that there is a strange attraction at times to doing something that you're not supposed to be doing? Growing up, hey, don't go over there. Why? There must be something really fun over there. Or whatever it might be. Whatever it might be. You know, because it's forbidden. It must have some... 
some really significant amount of fun attached to it. You know, like, okay, little Billy, don't drink a whole gallon of milk at one time. And you start chugging it, and you find out what happens after that. Okay, little Sarah, don't try to fit that dime in your nose. It's not good. Why? And the kids have, you know, the fire department come out. Sin is the same way. It's not bad because it's forbidden. God forbids sin because it's bad. God's not trying to ruin your life, ruin your fun. He's trying to protect you. And Paul recognizes, as we study here in Romans 7, that the law forbids certain things, but sin takes advantage of that and attempts to make it attractive. Hey, that's what the rule says, but let's bend it. Hey, let's be a rebel and not show up on time to class, or whatever it might be. That the sinful desires that we have, that sin will actually make breaking the rules look attractive. Well, if you just did this one-time thing on this website, or if you just went there that one, you know, there's like an attraction there because it's forbidden. You know, like those alcohol commercials you see all the time. I mean, you see these actors and really fitness models with these chiseled features and six-pack abs, you know, just partying and drinking booze. But let me tell you something. If you drank as much as those advertisements say you should drink, you wouldn't be looking like that at all. Those six-packs turn into kegs real quick. (laughs) It's not like that at all. But that's the whole scene. And then all of a sudden, you know, people are drinking out, and this is what you want, and it looks attractive. I mean, Satan is not an idiot. Sin looks attractive. Why would it be tempting if it was something so repulsive that you couldn't even look at it so things will look attractive? And you'll know because God will say, hey, don't do this. This is going to lead to a bad place. You don't want to do it. Hey, everybody's doing it, man. Come on, try it out. It's not that bad. Look, there's a whole bunch of us that say it's okay. So that means it's okay if there's a lot of us doing the same thing. In verse 9 it says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. And so when the law is instituted, you see now very clearly that you have fallen short. That you have done that which was wrong. And the background of Paul the Apostle who wrote this letter to the Romans, he was a Pharisee. And when it came to God's law, it was perfect. He was perfect, man. Like every ritual, every ceremony, he was on point. He kept the law and he boasted in his own righteousness by so doing. But Paul came to the realization that God's laws were spiritual and dealt more with the attitudes of the heart than the actions. Because listen, the laws are given to curve the evil. Because people do evil things, we now have the law with consequences to help people not do those things. But having the law doesn't change a person's heart. Do you see, we see that in society. Could you imagine if society's lives were changed, like who they were on the inside were changed, so that they wanted to live their lives to glorify God? The law is there to show people that this is wrong and that there are consequences to those actions. But the spirit of the law behind the law would be that mankind would have a heart that is honest and a heart that is right with God. The actions spring from the attitudes. The way that I communicate and the way that I live and the way that I act is actually showing you who I am inside. And so though the law may curve those things, it doesn't help me be a better person. Because inside me is sinful. Inside me is a propensity to do those things that are wrong. So point number three as we conclude this morning. Law law brings dominion. We see that as point number one. Because the law is over us as long as we live. Number two, the law brings knowledge. Like the law shows what's right and what's wrong and makes it very clear. And thirdly and finally, the law brings death. And you think, whoa, how? Well, listen. The law rules over you because of your sin. You need the law. Because I do bad things, there's got to be something in society that is implemented that protects people from themselves. Because of sin, the law now shows you what sin is. 
In verse 10, and the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. He's saying the very thing that I thought I could do to be righteous before God actually just showed me that I am not righteous because I sin. Do you get that? Paul is saying, hey, here's the law and all the lists of the do's and the don'ts. And the very thing that I thought, this list, that would help me be righteous before God actually showed me how far I fall from the standard of perfection. And so the very thing that I thought would bring me life and an entrance into heaven, it says actually I found to bring death. Because the commandments which were thought to bring life and righteousness before God in actuality condemned all men because the Bible actually says that the playing field is level for everybody. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Myself included and every single person that has ever walked the face or will walk the face of this earth. So you think, who then can get to heaven then? Who then can be saved? If the law just actually, you know, is this, is this buffer for society, the law shows me what's right and what's wrong, but doesn't change who I am on the inside, how in the world is anybody going to get to heaven then? Through faith in Jesus. By a personal relationship with God. You're made alive spiritually. And who we are on the inside changes. In verse 11, it says, For sin, Romans 7, we're almost done here. This is our last verse. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Keeping the rules, trying to be a good enough person because you keep the rules cannot make you righteous before God. All that the law can do or the rules can do and the regulations that you might seek to follow all they can do is condemn you to death because you fail to keep them. Sin is deceptive. It promises satisfaction, but it's temporal at best. It promises freedom, but it enslaves. Sin promises full life, but it leaves you empty. Sin promises you, promises you a free pass, but leaves you guilty. And if you follow sin all the way down the path, it leads you to death. The soul that sins will surely die, the Bible says. And if the Bible says also that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that means that we're all deserving of death. But then God sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for the sins of the world. That no matter who you are or what you've done, that you can be forgiven of your sins. This is a game changer. This revolutionizes the way that we see life because no longer are we bound to something that we could never be good enough to keep. We're free from that. However, the law isn't evil, the law isn't sinful. But when I'm united with Christ and I've been made alive spiritually and now I'm a changed man or I'm a changed woman, everything that the law said now applies to the spirit of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Thou shalt not kill. Well, I'm not getting angry enough to kill people anymore because God's changed me. Thou shalt not steal. I'm not robbing people's garages because I've been changed inside. The spirit changed. The letter of the law said, thou shalt not do this, but now I don't want to do this. I have no desire to do that because I'm a changed person. And so Paul is laying the groundwork for what we understand today very simply as this. A personal relationship with God. That's it. Yeah, we had some pretty intense parts of Scripture here and some things that are pretty massive that would take a long time to go in depth, but for our time today, this is what we need to understand. God gave the law and the men that enforced the law, but the law is spirit, and it's meant to deal with the attitudes of the heart. When you try to keep the law, you'll find out that you're not perfect and it actually shows you that you've sinned. And if you've been shown your sin, what it should do is show you your need for forgiveness and your need for a Savior. And so, that's where we conclude our study this morning. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your word. We thank you, God, that you have given us just a great and tremendous opportunity, Lord, to be able to study your holy scriptures and to be able, Lord, to understand what they say. Lord, for all of us, in some time in our life, Lord, maybe even today included, 
Lord, sometimes reading certain things in the Bible is, is heavy and it's difficult. And then some things are just really easy to understand. And Lord, I pray that today that this passage of Scripture that we looked at, Lord, would sink deeply into our hearts today. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be those men and those women that you've created us to be. Lord, I ask that you would please, Lord, strengthen us in our hearts and in the inner man. Lord, that we might be good examples in how we live and how we communicate, how we treat one another. And Lord, I ask today, Lord, if there are any that have been dealing, Lord, with guilt, past mistakes, Lord, if there are any here this morning that may know of you, may know about Jesus dying on the cross, Lord, maybe they've gone to church before, or maybe they haven't, Lord, and they've showed up here today, and Lord, they've heard these things. Maybe they're watching online right now, Lord, or maybe they'll see this on, a, on an app one day. I don't know, Lord, but I pray, God, that if there are any here, whether they know a lot or know a little, that have not personally committed their life to you and asked you to forgive them of their sin, I pray, Lord, that today they would make the greatest decision of their life and, Lord, have that personal relationship with you. Jesus, you said in your word that you're the way, the truth, and the life and that no man comes to the Father but through you. And so, Lord, I ask for any that have walked away or any, Lord, that that do not know you personally today, Lord, that they would make that decision to put their faith in you and have their sins forgiven. And with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you're here this morning and you've heard these things and it's just made sense and you think, all oh, right, okay, the law shows me that I've sinned because I'm not perfect. Who is, right? And you understand that you've fallen short of that perfect standard and that it's not even your righteousness that gets you into heaven. It's actually the righteousness of Jesus that comes to you through your faith in him. But if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, whether you would consider yourself religious or not, but you know that you've sinned and you want to have that forgiveness of your sin, then I'm going to ask with every eye closed in this entire house and every head bowed, that if you've never given your life to Jesus and you like to be forgiven of your sins and you can be that new man today or that new woman today, then I'd like to ask that if you'd like to do that, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand wherever you're at and say, yes, that's me. I'd like to put my faith in Jesus today. I'd like to commit him, commit to him my life. Just raise your hand wherever you're at. And also, if you're here this morning, and maybe you've walked away from the Lord, and at one time, you know, you were walking strong with him, but then today you found yourself in a place where maybe you're like, man, I've slipped and you need to come back to the Lord today, then would you raise your hand as well today so I can pray for you and lead you in that prayer of rededicating or dedicating your life to Jesus. Anybody else, just raise your hand. Right on. For those of you that raised your hands, maybe some of you are like, oh, I'm not raising my hand. Well, listen, I'm just gonna pray for you anyway, and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer of dedicating your life to Jesus. So would you just please repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart? just quietly in your heart and say, Dear Jesus, I know that I have sinned, but I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you love me, even knowing everything about me. I thank you that you died on the cross for my sins, and I thank you that you have forgiven me of all the wrong that I have ever done. Would you fill me with your love? and your joy, and your peace, and give me your strength that I may be who you've created me to be. For I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, I pray for these that have prayed that prayer, Lord. I ask God that you would strengthen them and help them now, Lord, as they start this new relationship with you. Lord, for those that have heard these things and they're like, hmm, I'm going to think about this. I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to speak to them. And Lord, show them your truths in, in your word. And Lord, we pray for our church. We ask God that you continue to bless it. And Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would keep us all safe as we go our way. And Lord, again, we just pray for the Irvine Police Department and ask, Lord, for your blessings to be upon them in all that they do. Give them favor in this community. Give him favor, Lord, in this state and in this country. 
And Lord, I ask for these things, and we ask for these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. That's all.